when I talk about virtual, virtual protests. Um, but instead of jumping right into the phenomenon, um, I would like to start out by telling you how I got the idea of uh, looking at Chinese protests um, and uh, conceptualizing them as consisting of a physical and an online component. It really all started seven years ago with something that Daniel already mentioned, which is uh, the so-called Wikidonna or not the news database. And in 2013 or 2014, a journalist called me to talk about protests in China. And um, at the end of the interview, she told me about this new website that she discovered where someone documented dozens of protests, uh, protest events every day. The name of the website was Wikidonna or not the news, Fei Xinwen. Um, and the brain behind this protest collection is uh, Lu Yu, uh, the gentleman that you're seeing in this photo. Um, and I'm not going to say that Wikidonna is one of the best resources to study collective action in China because it really is the best resource. So in 2013, he and uh, a changing cast of partners started to look through Chinese media and social media um, to find protest events and then publish them on a blog hosting website. And four, least, four years later in 2016, they had collected evidence on more than 70,000 events that uh, had happened all over China. So they did a great service to those who are interested in collective action, contentious politics and so on in China. Uh, the data set stops in 2016 because Lu was arrested and sentenced uh, to four years in prison, um, allegedly because four of these 70,000 protest events uh, contained rumors. So he was sentenced for um, uh, on the sort of provoking trouble charge and got almost the maximum sentence and was released last year. Now here's a brief overview of uh, the sort of um, statistics or uh, uh, characteristics of this collection, uh, which is still online and very easy to find, and you have to link uh, up there. Um, most of the records on this web page consist of several posts from different media sources, and the Wikidonna Collective made sure to verify that each protest um, was indeed a protest by cross-checking other sources and sometimes even by uh, contacting the persons who posted something online. Uh, and this is why, because of this multi-source uh, characteristic of this website, we have for 70,000 events, or more than 70,000 events, we have uh, over 600,000 images and alone from Weibo, 170,000 posts. Now, this data is fantastic and gave us a lot of important insights. And I, as Daniel just introduced, I tried to, to work with, with that and well, try to, um, I, I used the data and uh, wrote about sort of an overview, a quantitative overview of where protests happen and why they happen. Um, and also used this data set to tease out the, well, determinants or factors that uh, are responsible that protests uh, receive or are repressed in China. Um, but of course, I wanted to know also what happened before 2016 when they started and what happened after 2016. So I decided to, well, try to, well, not replicate their work because I could never do that because I lacked the skills and, and the energy and the connections and everything. So what they did really is unique, but to, I don't know, maybe have a second or third best solution which is um, using, well, not manual labor, but using a computer to search for posts in social media. And then um, among the very many results that I um, obtained by searching for a number of key terms, um, you know, take this result and data and the images, and then try to find out um, if what I was downloading is a protest event or is uh, not a protest event. And this turned out to be very hard work because about one post in 100 that I downloaded was actually related to a protest event. So how did I do that? Well, actually I used um, 
well, uh, AI or artificial neural networks to identify protests. So the first step really was, uh, and that of course AI is not involved, to use the keyword search and download posts that contain terms that I found to be related to protests that often appear in posts related to protests. And then I would download the whole post, which means the text element and the images attached to the post. Um, I then tried to use both sources to classify or to, yeah, to, to classify a post into a protest post and a non-protest post. I did that by sort of fine tuning a language model, um, Ernie from, from Baidu. So basically uh, they fed um, a transformer or some also some sort of artificial um, intelligence thing with um, uh, billions of documents and in that way taught it Chinese. And what I did is I used um, the messages from Wikidonna to, um, well, tell this, uh, tell Ernie uh, what a protest is, or what um, kind of words or sentences are associated with a protest um, and uh, where they're not associated with a protest and sort of fine tuned it to um, give me a prediction if a post is about a protest or not. And um, I set the bar very low um, and excluded everything that was below this low bar and included everything that, that was above it. I then used the images or at least uh, 30,000 uh, or 20,000 of these images to train a convolutional neural network um, also to recognize, let's say, an organized protest. So this convolutional neural, neural network will recognize banners. It will recognize um, lots of people wearing the same clothes, especially if they, they have, if they have characters on them. It will recognize uh, people holding signs. It will recognize people kneeling down in front of signs and so on. Um, and here I set the threshold very high. So if this uh, artificial neural network is very confident that this image is a protest image, I also included it. And if sort of Baidu and the CNN, the convolutional neural network, both say it's a protest, I would include it. Um, at a first uh, glance, it, it all looked very good. Um, but then fortunately, uh, in the context of my project, um, I have an excellent team, and I think this is the chance or, or here the, the opportunity to thank them for all the work they've done to make this uh, project happening and make this project successful. And I had two human coders, two native um, Chinese speakers um, who uh, um, coded a random sample of 20,000 uh, Weibo posts uh, to say, do they contain a protest or not? Um, and then um, I um, assessed the quality of the, my model against the benchmark that they set. Uh, and the result is that the precision uh, of this model is about 85%. So 85% um, of the events that I have in my data set are indeed related to protests and 15% are false positives. But the recall is um, less than half, which means that um, I underestimate the amount of uh, protests by about 60%. Um, so uh, as impressive as this may sound, it does not replace uh, human coding. So it lags far, far, far behind uh, the work um, that the Wicked Honor Collective did. Just very briefly, what does it look like? Um, these are the protests I found by issues. And remember, um, it's a very conservative estimate um, where we see for, especially for real estate protests and for labor protests, an increase until about 2016, and then it slowly um, declines. Now, um, as fantastic as this resource is, um, and well, looking at images and texts while I was uh, training the, these, these networks, I began to wonder why do we have this fantastic data in the first place? Why are there tens of thousands of protests documented on social media? Uh, who writes social media posts on protest events in China? And well, there are really only two possible groups. 
um, the first groups are those who are observers. And at first I thought, you know, these, this is the main group that will um, post about protests. So here, for example, you see it's written in the third person. Maybe somebody was sent this post or maybe um, they found it on the internet. Um, you know, so groups, journalists, um, self media and so on will um, post about protests occasionally uh, in this way uh, as observers. The second group, and this is the group I'm of course interested in, is the protesters themselves. So um, here, for example, you have um, homeowners trying to obtain government support in their conflict they have with a developer who allegedly violated or defaulted on a contract, which unfortunately is, um, yeah, is happening very often in China. Um, and here, you know, they write about the grievance and post images about the protest. Um, and I'm interested in uh, why they're doing this. And I want to look at this group of people who post about protests themselves um, and why they do this. Um, and this is where I come to this concept of see my virtual protests. Um, the argument that I want to make today is that microblogging about protest uh, emerging from this group is not simply their documentation of a physical protest, but it is part of the protest itself. And that part is maybe as important and maybe even more important than uh, the street activity. And because these protests have a physical um, component, like here in the image, the flags and so on, uh, where they obviously had been there and, and had conducted this protest, so they have a physical component, but they also have a virtual or an online component where they then write about uh, their protest, um, but also try to mobilize a virtual audience to, well, do something uh, and uh, to help them. And uh, yeah, I think uh, semi-virtual protest or hybrid protest maybe might be a good word to describe this phenomenon. Um, very briefly, what is um, uh, a semi-virtual protest and where does it maybe come from? Well, we actually know a lot about the dynamics of popular protest. So typically, um, individuals with agreements would first petition high-level governments. Uh, this doesn't work. And then they would organize a demonstration. Um, so by staging a public protest, the idea is to force the hand of, of leaders who are, um, well, you know, if, if, if a major big protest happens, then they might get punished or they, it might negatively affect their career options. So by um, threatening a demonstration or by engaging in a small demonstration, they're trying to put pressure on them to solve the problem. Um, so protests in China are not about opposing the government, but rather, um, appealing to higher level governments to call lower level governments to order or to call private actors to order. Um, but there is a risk uh, because we know from research by um, scholars like Tsai uh, for example, that not every protest is successful. And in fact, most protests do not lead to um, concessions by the government or uh, or help by the government. And um, those of you who speak Chinese and who study protests um, probably know the saying, So if you make a big ruckus, then the likelihood um, of your grievance being resolved will be high. Um, if you make a small ruckus, uh, it will be low. Uh, if you don't complain at all, nothing is going to happen. So the idea is you must go out and protest. And the bigger you protest, the higher the likelihood is that a contention or that concessions ensue. But of course, engaging in a protest like that is also very risky because um, the more people there are um, and the more, um, well, violent or uh, it gets or the more um, thoroughfares are blocked and the more it influences public life, the, um, the higher the likelihood is 
that you might get arrested and even sentenced uh, to a prison sentence. Um, there's a second element to that. Uh, it's not only the intensity of the protest, but we also know that protests have a higher likelihood of obtaining concessions when they're reported in the media. But um, we have like dozens in, in, in 2014, 2015, maybe at some periods, maybe hundreds, pro hundreds of protests a day. But of course, you don't have hundreds of newspaper articles about protests. But a very, very small fraction of protests gets published in the news. So the news are, for the protesters, a gatekeeper. You know? And um, we know that pre-internet protesters would also write to journalists, um, sometimes pay them, uh, and try to entice them to come to the protest location and do a report on the grievances. Now, the idea, I think, is that Traditional media is now not the only channel that protesters can use to uh, gain such attention. So social media enables them to, well, at least try and mobilize a lot of, 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 of people. So potentially they can reach yeah, um, millions or, or billions of people through social media. Um, if, of course, their post is reposted. And um, I think that is, you know, what they're trying to do is it doesn't cost them much to um, showcase their protest on social media. And um, if they're successful, um, they, yeah, so, so the, how do you say, uh, cost effect or um, cost benefit ratio is very favorable for protesters. So, yeah, what they're doing is combining physical protest and online activity, and the posts uh, provide information not only on the activity, but also the background of a protest. And the ultimate aim, again, is not to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party, um, but bring the grievance to the attention of powerful government officials and convince them to intervene. Um, so and the, so the, the virtual audience, those who see these posts, are um well intermediate so they are amplifiers they are they are appealed to to amplify a post and thereby uh, bring it to the attention of the the officials and because as you will see most of these virtual protest accounts don't have a lot of followers but they're hoping that somebody will see it somebody with a lot of followers will see it and repost it i think it's more than a gofundme campaign than the Arab Spring. So hoping that um, you're lucky that it will get attention and eventually your, your problems will be resolved. Why is this important? Well, um, as I said, the logic behind the protests in China is to appeal to officials and media serves as an uh, amplifier and that self-media might be uh, serving as a way to overcome uh, journalists gatekeepers. And I think the answer to this question is relevant for China studies, um, not only because it might seem surprising that in, in a highly authoritarian country, you have so many posts um, about protests on Weibo that, you know, many of them are still existing there. Um, but also, you know, in this system, why are using protesters social media? So I think this uh, new category will give us some, some ideas into who are the persons who post about protests uh, on the Chinese internet. Um, but the answer, I think, is also relevant for comparative research on the role of social media in popular protests. You know, research in the Arab Spring tells you that the internet is being used or social media are being used for mobilization and for drawing people to join protests. But it's very diff different um, in China. Um, another, uh, well, uh, characteristic of the research on the Arab Spring um, and also comparative research on protest is that very often we have to focus on large scale protests, you know, also like Occupy Central, for example, um, the sunflower protests, sunflower movements. So these are all big protests. But what we are observing here in China is small protests. And the question is, you know, are small protests um, and these strategies specific to China 
or do they exist elsewhere as well and we just haven't looked at them. Um, so in this way, I think our study of Chinese protests will also provide some insights that might be relevant or informative for um, comparative research. So in the rest, the second half, so to speak, of this talk, um, I will do uh, a little description and then trying to give you some indicators of um, how uh, common these semi-virtual protests are and how they have developed in the last uh, couple of years. So the first point we've already done, I've tried to um, convince you that what I'm looking at here is academically relevant. Um, and now I'm going to show you some examples uh, to, well, uh, drive home the characteristics of semi-virtual protests. So what are they and what are their features? Um, once I've done that, um, I'll try and take some of the characteristics that I found and use them to classify my whole data set of about 90,000 protests to see um, which of them could be classified as semi-virtual protests and um, yeah, how have they developed? Um, I will give a little, um, yeah, or uh, share my observations, what I think, uh, what impact they have, and then uh, finish the presentation by um, mentioning some of the limitations of having to rely on online sources. Um, Daniel talked about um, both quantitative research on protests uh, and qualitative research on protests. Ideally, we would be doing both. Um, and not being able, for example, to talk to people who set up these accounts and who engage in these uh, accounts uh, is a very big well, limitation of this research. All right. Um, first of all, so what are characteristics? So one thing that struck me when I looked through the images is that uh, some of the protests you don't see as you might expect, a camera from above or um, from behind filming or photographing protesters as they are um, holding up their banners and facing uh, the government building or the factory or whatever. What you see here is something that's, that looks like an arranged photo shoot. So first of all, the ministry, and here I think it's, a, uh, it's public security, I can't read the sign now, I think it's going on. Um, is in the background and they're facing away from it instead of to it. They're kneeling down so the sign can be seen and I think this is intentional. Uh, they're holding up their, their placards in a way that uh, each placard is visible and they're holding them up in a way that their faces are hidden. Uh, so I think this image was taken uh, specifically for the purpose of being uh, po posted on social media. What is also interesting is that there is that there are no other participants, there is no audience, there doesn't seem to be anyone standing around. So a very lonely protest where you could almost imagine these individuals coming in, sitting down, holding up their signs and then maybe leaving or having to leave and you see the security people in the background already being very curious about what is happening in there. So this protest um, is aimed clearly at Weibo users at a virtual audience. Um, but this is not the only characteristic or indicator I've, I've found to, well, um, see if a protest we're looking at is a, uh, can be characterized as a semi-virtual protest or simply um, a third-hand account um, of, or a witness account of a protest. So here, for example, another indicator is mentioning the media and the government. What is interesting here is if you look at the handle, at the name of this account, um, uh, this name is already related to, um, to, 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 to sort of rights defense actions. So uh, who is going to help us or who is going to um, you know, protect 
us as a vulnerable group. So they're calling themselves a vulnerable group in uh, that thing. So it's not a private account, but it's a group account established for um, posting about protests. Um, what you also see here is um, that they're adding, uh, that they're mentioning a few government and media organs, again, with a help to, uh, with a hope that they will, um, that they will either publish or write about the protest or do something uh, it. Um, yeah, so this protest here, as many in China, is related to real estate. Uh, the police is accused of colluding with the developers and then actually beating up owners. And a lot of this activity here is documented in the images in this post. Uh, in this case, uh, Sichuan TV, um, the post says, already came to the neighborhood. Um, and the purpose of this post is to alert those who see the post that uh, it will be on TV, that, you know, to watch it, um, but also to help and spread the news uh, to get even more exposure. This asking for help is also a characteristic um, that happens uh, quite often. Uh, here are two examples. The example on the left-hand side is an environmental protest um, in Qingdao. Uh, and the post, the very long post, I cut it, says that uh, at night, uh, noxious fumes appear from an unknown source. And the post then tells the story how the cities appeal to the mayor's office, to environmental authorities, to journalists, and nothing helped. Um, at one time, the environmental department published a public report, but it was deleted uh, the next day. Uh, and so they describe all this and then end by saying that they are afraid to die. So they say, if the source of the pollution is not discovered, who knows how many of us will still be alive in a few years. And then, um, as you know, the red frame, if you see this, please repost, please save us. On the right hand side, you see an account from a student um, who protested, who participated in the protest in Nanjing in summer. Um, the post also starts with, please save us, describes the reason for the protest, the scope of the protest, and also then describes the violence that um, the students had to endure and the injuries they sustained. Here, um, again, uh, which makes it much clearer that they are asking uh, for help to appeal to the government. This is a protest because of a land grab, um, which also happens frequently in China, that land is taken away from farmers uh, in this post. They accuse uh, some people and some government departments of selling the only resettlement land available in the, in the village, so common land that can be used um, you know, for development or for giving villagers uh, a place to, to, to set up their home. Um, they're writing down the demands and asking Weibo users to share them explicitly so the relevant authorities will see them. Uh, again, you know, this is something where I think the argument that this is a semi-virtual protest, I think this is a good indicator uh, that the post is not only a documentation, but actually um, an integral part of the protest itself. Here, something new um, in comparison with the previous posts, it includes not only protest images, but also documents as evidence. So here you see two petitions that the villagers had sent to the government. Uh, it also shows the plan of the village that shows the resettlement land. So um, they're documenting uh, their accusations against the village government. And this post really has two pur purposes. First, convincing the virtual audience to repost and to, to make the post maybe go viral. And the second um, function is to bring it to the attention of the government. Um, another um, characteristic I saw is the cross-linking between protests. So here um, on the left, we have a P2P um, financing platform protest. So uh, a P2P platform defaulted on payments. Um, on the right-hand side, we have a protest against a garbage incinerator, also very common. Um, to maximize impact, the protesters here in both um, protests make use of several platforms, um, 
on the right, they shot the video on Kwaisho, uh, a video platform, and then forwarded it to Weibo and promoted it in Weibo. So they can reach the Kwaisho audiences, but also the Weibo audiences. Uh, then here they briefly report on the grievance, grievances, accuse the authorities um, of not doing anything, appeal uh, to, uh, you know, and asking the users, appealing to the users to share the post or provide help, whatever help that might be. Um, the P2P protest, they also described the situation, appeal to high level leaders to fix this according to the law, um, appeal to their sense of justice, um, and also the readers sense of justice, don't let them do whatever they want, uh, and return our hard earned money, Juan Woman is uh, this uh, phrase also comes off in, in, in protests. Um, here they're asking all kind hearted people to help out and repost or like this post so that more victims can join a public QQ group to organize and defend their rights together. So this, um, and I'm really surprised that this is still online because they're, well, um, yeah, asking people to organize, which is a no-no in China. Here, um, again, uh, an example of adding documentation or examples of adding documentation and cross-linking. So here they're linking to a Zhihu account where they're asking a question, which really is a complaint on Zhihu, um, a platform where you can um, ask questions and receive answers similar to Quora that some of you might know. Um, again, here's evidence of a protest, uh, no physical audience, uh, two or three persons standing there holding up a banner in front of a building. Um, in the documents, even you have the important sections underlined. On the right hand side, um, you see a protest that not only has no spectators, no physical spectators, but also no protesters, also very common hanging banners from your windows. So if your um, sort of classification of a protest depends on at least five people taking part, here you don't see the persons. So um, it's, uh, it's hung from government buildings. Again, um, uh, the evidence is being supplied uh, to not only documents, but also models of a building uh, where sort of the building in question is, is circled in and other things to convince uh, the readers that the developers defaulted, uh, that the protesters um, are protesting for their rightful uh, or for their legal rights and appeal to the sense of justice to go and share. Here, uh, more um, on adding documentation. Again, uh, uh, you know, here is another interesting example, not only because of the documentation, but also because of the account itself. Uh, the account name is eSpeed Loan Company Complainants. Uh, the post describes how the police moved against this uh, P2P platform and arrested investors who petitioned because they lost money. Uh, they said uh, the QQ group, QQ is a little bit like Facebook, um, was blocked um, and the hashtag eSpeed Loan Injustice case was deleted and also posts were deleted on Weibo. Uh, again, they provide all kinds of documents and other evidence. Um, what is interesting about this is uh, if you look at another post, you see it's another group, the same logo, but another name, another account uh, in a similar post. Uh, and then I looked at sort of this group or similar accounts and found that there are 23 different accounts posting very similar content on Weibo uh, in, in 2016. So we also have cases where um, users set up several platforms uh, to, well, um, well, appeal to Weibo uh, microbloggers, users, spectators to go in and help out. Which brings me to the protest accounts. Uh, here, an example about forced demolition. The post says that at three o'clock in the morning, and this is this is like a nightmare post, and you see many nightmare posts if you if you go through this. But this is you can almost feel it uh, that this uh, how it is described that at three o'clock in the morning, a group of more than ten people uh, came with demolition equi equipment and raised down at least four houses to the ground. So somebody comes, kicks you out of your house and just destroys the house. 
The post says that the residents hadn't received the legal notice and weren't forewarned. Um, so they were standing there in the heavy rain with their, with their houses de um, de demolished. Um, again, there is a banner, but no physical audience. So very clearly this post is directed at a virtual audience. Also, there is only one post in this whole account. Um, uh, and this account was obviously created for the purpose of seeking help on the internet, just as the last uh, account was. And I call these protest accounts because they're not private accounts posting about a protest, but actually accounts set up for the purpose of informing others of a protest. Um, yeah, so all the, account, all the posts are related to a specific protests. Uh, here, um, an example, uh, just to see what it looks like when you scroll through a user's timeline of one of these protest accounts. So it doesn't mean that you only have one post in one account, but you can have one, two, three, five, 20, sometimes even 30 posts only related to one uh, specific, uh, specific protest. So here, if you scroll through documents, more documents, uh, similar posts, sometimes the same post, posted and reposted, um, giving viewers an idea of how, um, yeah, of how bad the situation is. And of course, trying by reposting content very often to make it uh, more or to, to, to increase the chance that a post will reach someone uh, who can help uh, and empower. I think what you see here is an automated post congratulating, congratulating uh, the post owner for um, his or her birthday. Um, okay, why do we get this again? Yeah, no, this one, yeah. So to um, get all these characteristics together that I found by simply going through the post and through the images, um, indicators of a semi-virtual protest might be that protesters um, post themselves. So nobody does it for them or nobody simply documents a post, but the protesters are the ones posting about the protests. That there is visual evidence of a physical protest. So it's different from um, online protests uh, that also go back to sort of basically since the internet has been available in China, uh, also, that's time on um, bulletin board services like Kenya and so on, where um, people posted their petitioning documents and asked others to help or for legal advice without protesting, though. Um, so it's not an online protest, but it, it actually starts with a physical protest, and this physical protest is also documented there. We have sometimes arranged photos. We have appeals to government and the media appeals to a virtual audience uh, to help in any way they can, or at least repost uh, uh, documentation to add credibility, cross-linking between platforms, and again, here protest accounts or accounts dedicated to a protest event. Um, I was interested in how many protest accounts there are, because as you will see later, um, there is uh, a relationship also between asking for help, asking to repost, and the number of posts you have in an account. So usually these three things go together. There's a very high correlation between um, calls for help, calls to repost, um, adding uh, the media, and um, having very few posts. They usually go together. Um, so to, to get an idea, of how many protest accounts we have or what the percentage of protest accounts is in China. Um, I simply um, counted those posts, uh, those accounts which have um, uh, several protest posts, um, but less than 20, 20 posts uh, altogether. And uh, this is what it looks like. So what you can see is, I mean, I expected for this phenomenon to really increase after 2016 when protests went down. Um, I don't think protests decreased in China because there are less issues now or less problems. I think protests decreased because um, in several ways, um, people in China have been discouraged from taking to the streets and from, from protesting. And so I thought that, you know, to maybe leave a smaller footprint, footprint when you do post, that um, the amount of 
protest accounts is going to increase since 2016. Um, there is indeed a steep increase after 2016. So as the amount of protests goes down, um, the uh, per week here, uh, the amount or the percentage of protest accounts increases. But we also see that uh, setting up protest accounts is something that had begun pretty much since uh, here in this case, Weibo had been available. Now, why do people set up protest accounts? Are they afraid of losing their private account? Um, uh, you know, uh, is it because, uh, you know, do we see less protest intensity, more online mobilization? Are there other reasons? I don't know. So this is, as they say, for future research. I also looked um, at the, um, the, the, the add-ons of the post. So how many of the pictures that are attached to a post are actually depictions of a protest? Um, and how much is or how many of these images are other types of documentation, like you know documents and um, and, and and all the stuff that I shown you before, and here you see that post that sort of the percentage um, of protest scenes in the appendices is also slightly increasing, which means that there is a tendency to not only depict a protest but to also add other evidence uh, in order to, as I showed you, convince and um, provide evidence uh, to Weibo users or social media users that their grievance is funded in reality and uh, sort of to appeal to their sense of moral justice to, to help out. Now, um, I was also interested in uh, if the protest accounts or the setting up of protest accounts as a relationship to issues, because I expected that we would mainly see protest accounts with uh, real estate um, protests. Why? Because real estate protests are staged or initiated by what you might say uh, persons who are, or individuals who are members of the middle class, which means they're technologically savvy. Uh, they are afraid of losing their private accounts. Um, they know how to set up multiple accounts for Weibo and so on. So I thought we would see protest accounts, so accounts created for the sake of um, amplifying a protest, mainly with this group. Um, but what it looks like is that we, and here you see the, the red sort of shape, is um, the average amount of protest accounts in all accounts. And then uh, you see the, 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 the blue line is uh, the percentage of protest accounts in protest posts on a specific issue. So among, let's say, all medical protests, protests about medical issues, um, um, those who post about medical issues, how many of these accounts or what percentage of these accounts are protest accounts solely post about this protest. And you see that Interestingly enough, well, uh, real estate is very close to the mean for the simple reason that most protests are real estate protests. But where I thought that maybe things like fraud or education, where you have um, groups with higher levels of education posting that they would have um, a higher ratio of protest accounts, it's actually medical issues, evictions, pollutions, rural land, where you have higher proportion of protest accounts. And that is surprising because both or all four issues are associated with a, with a significantly higher level of repression as I found out in previous research. I don't know if there is a relationship and you know if there is a relation, relationship, what is the relationship? Is it related to the characteristics of the owners? Are they maybe uh, less networked? Um, is it possible that maybe they didn't have a private account at all? So in the countryside, you know, um, social media is not so common in the country, or it is common, but in the countryside, people still use QQ and not so much Weibo, where this data comes from. So maybe, uh, you know, Weibo is new for them. And uh, this is actually the first account they set up. Um, maybe they didn't have any social media accounts at all. Um, I don't know, uh, but it's interesting. Uh, I think it's very counterintuitive that you would see um, a larger ratio with this with this group. 
Now, uh, very quickly about or two slides, and then I'm uh, I'm done with this uh, presentation. I'm finished. Uh, is what is their impact? Uh, how I mean, does their strategy work? So, well, most posts are not reposted. So here you see a histogram with um, the number of posts I found on the y-axis and, um, oh, sorry, uh, the x-axis label is missing, and um, the number of reposts on the, the uh, x-axis. So here the zero means zero reposts. So we have more than 6,000 um, posts that are not reposted at all, which is the largest group, and so on. So. Um, it uh, sort of decreases log logical log logarithmically. Um, you know, so um, the higher the number of reposts, the few the, the fewer posts with a high number we have, basically. Um, of course, now um, we we don't see a lot about twenty, forty, sixty. It looks like uh, not many posts are uh, reposted a few dozen times which is true, but of course, um, given the large uh, bar at the zero level, we don't see what, what's below there, uh, because actually there are quite a number of posts that are being reposted a few times, as you see here. So I chose another way to not only look at the posts themselves, but to um, uh, look at reposts uh, per week. And again, you see not a lot. Um, I chose the maximum uh, or you know, what is the post with the maximum of reposts in a given week. Um, and here you see that uh, we do have um, posts that, are, that receive a few dozens um, and at some points even more than 100 reposts, which I think is not bad. Uh, it's not viral, um, but if you start out with an account with uh, very few followers and very few posts and you get a few hundred uh, um, reposts, that, act, that is actually quite an achievement. So this maybe illustrates the lotto game uh, or the GoFundMe game you're engaging with. If you're lucky, you'll get reposted a few hundred times. Now, the limitations of this study, um, one of the limitation is that, uh, well, you know, I can't contact the protesters and ask them all the questions I would like to ask them. It's not that I can't technically contact them. I can, of course, but it's um, ethnically problematic because contacting them um, might put them in danger. So I cannot exclude that me writing to them or me sending them a personal message on Weibo will not have consequences for them, which means I'm not going to do it. Um, we have only limited information in social media posts. Uh, they're very brief. That's, of course, a limitation. Um, we also don't know the outcomes. So I showed you in the pre previous graph the maximum reposts, but I don't know if you know this led to concessions, if led, this led to a resolution. From the data I have, I have no way of find, finding out. It's quite interesting that sometimes in the comments, users would ask the original posters if um, you know, they received the concession, what the result of their protest was, but um, usually they don't, they don't get an answer. So this is also, the comments are also not a good way of finding out whether a protest worked or not. Then of course, the classifiers I trained recognize only organized protest because you need to hold up something, but not spontaneous protest. Of course, I can train the classifier and I did train the classifier to recognize groups of people but um, you'd be astonished how many photos there are on social media of people standing around, many more than protests. Um, also, you know, with text that is slightly critical of something. So the text classifier says, well, you know, this might be related to a protest because um, social media users don't say we are protesting very often. Um, very often you don't have a word indicating, indicating that a protest is happening at all in the text. Um, very often the text is just cryptic, maybe to avoid censorship. Um, precision, again, here comes at a high cost of recall. So I'm, I'm seeing only, or I've looked maybe at, at, at half of the protests that I actually have in my database and um, my classifiers can't find them. And uh, now in recent years, data has become more and more difficult to obtain 
um, because of, well, uh, privacy regulations in China and so on, doxing regulations, data seems to disappear. Thank you for your attention.